Okay, so next Friday on my show, I've got a really exciting interview booked. I believe now is the right time to tell you who I'll be interviewing. I think you're going to like it. This person was crowned Miss England 2007. She's the fiancé to Danny from McFly. She's also deaf in one of her ears. She was recently fitted with the Phonak Nano Hearing Aid by Ronnie Gangley from Pin Drop Hearing, Harley Street in Paddington. I'm proud to announce that next week I'll be interviewing... Georgia Horsley! Yes, I am so excited. Next week is going to be played on my show. Then on Christmas Day, we're going to release a video version of my interview with Georgia Horsley. So make sure you listen out for that and keep it Wizard Ray J for updates. Georgia Horsley has lived an exciting life so far. She's a beauty model and she's getting married to Danny Jones from McFly. However, until 2007, there was a giant secret that she had kept in the public eye and one that, when it was revealed, would change her life forever. Um, so we're going to start from the beginning. Um, you are born in North Yorkshire. I was. Um, what was it sort of like growing up, and were there any sort of early telltale signs that you may one day go into modelling? Um, no, I think I was one of those ugly duckling stories. <laughs> um, as a child, I lived quite a, a tomboyish life. Spent most of my life climbing trees, digging holes, like ev- wow. everything a, tom- a, a tomboy would do. But um, yeah, I had a lovely little life and lived in a little market town and it was all very nice. I had a good group of friends and no, there was no signs ever that I would become a model. So as I say, so you started off sort of very tomboy. Yeah. When was it roughly that you sort of started getting Probably at about 16. Okay. I kind of became a bit more of a girl and, um, yeah, developed a love of, of all things fashion and and beauty. And it went from that, really. So going, going back a bit, at the age of two, a school nurse, to the surprise of the family, discovered that you were deaf in your right ear. Yeah, I was, um, well, it was when I was four. Oh, sorry. Yeah, um, and I, I started, like, preschool. And they, um, they did all the tests to check, you know, your sight and your hearing and, and everything. And the school nurse detected something probably wasn't quite right and told mum and dad about it. And then, yeah, and then it went from there and I had test after test and they realised I was completely deaf in one ear. <laughs> How was this something that you sort of hadn't noticed? Well, I had. Um, okay. My earliest childhood memory was lying on one side when mum was telling us a bedtime story and not being able to hear anything. And I used to go to mum, mummy, I can't hear anything when I lie this way. And mum thought it was just a, a technique for me not to go to bed. Oh, fine. Yeah. Because okay, <laughs> there was no, I didn't really show any other signs of it in any other way yeah. apart from that. So what was the reaction like from your family? when? when I think mum felt awful. She felt, <laughs> <laughs> she felt like the worst mother in the world. But, um, you know, it wasn't her fault. And they were just, I think they were, they were happy that it had been detected, you know, fairly early. So, I mean, it was only a short while before you found out, though, that you'd gone to hospital with meningitis. The doctors did a checkup on you then and yeah. everything was sort of... I don't, I don't know how it got missed, to be honest. Yeah, I don't know, uh, obviously some, a fault of some doctor somewhere, but... Did you ever sort of feel angry that maybe had you found out before? I mean, do you think... I yeah, don't think, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not angry at all. I don't think, to be honest, if it had have been detected earlier on, there's much else that I could have had done that I haven't had done already. Because back, oh God, it was so long ago now, back then the only hearing aid that they could offer me was something really big and it was, you know, in a battery pack, I'd have have a wire going down the back of my head and and it just wasn't, I didn't want it. Like, you know, when you're you're a young girl, 10 years old, you don't want a big 
you know, hearing it on your head. So were you more than happy to sort of live for a while? With yeah, her? yeah, it didn't really bother me too much. I think later on in life I realised there was a lot of things I must have missed. Yeah. Um, but, but back then I didn't know. I didn't know that people thought I was ignoring them and... I was missing out on conversations quite as much. When, in fact, when I was younger, um, for a few months, I was fully deaf. I Were was, you? Uh, yeah. I was, I was born with some hearing complications. I mean, now it was fine. Yeah. Um, and so, but I never had that experience of, you know, I always knew that it was only for a short while. Yeah. Um, so what was it like for you growing up knowing that this is something that could you know, never go? I think what frightens me the most out of anything is that the older I get, the worse it'll, pro- it'll get. Because, you know, as you get older, your hearing does go. So that's probably the one thing that worries me more than anything. How did you sort of learn to embrace it, though? Like, um, I just, I, I accepted it and accepted that I needed to tell people about it because beforehand I wouldn't tell anybody and I'd sit there in a conversation. You know, if we were sat on a, on a round table, a square table, I mean, that would be my worst nightmare and I was sat at this, at this end and that okay, everybody's yeah. voices were here. Um, and I wouldn't tell anyone. So I'd just sit there in silence and people okay. would think I was rude. <laughs> that's what would happen and and like I'm the most talkative person so it upset yeah. me that that's what people would think yeah and um, do you think then that how much did that sort of ch- shape your childhood yeah pro- probably didn't give people the best opinion of me <laughs> which is really bad thank god I made the friends I made who all knew you know what was going on and and how it was difficult for me sometimes yeah, I mean, growing up then you've got 10 GCSEs and A-level in art, two AS levels in geography and sociology, a diploma in anatomy and, and physiology, yeah. and a World <laughs> Cross Therapeutic Care Course qualification. Oh, yeah. That's not sort of the normal signs of a normal model. Really. <laughs> no, no. I mean, I can't say I'm like a member of Mensa or anything, but um, I'm not, yeah, I'm not um, a dumb blonde. Yeah. So, oh, anyway. <laughs> when did sort of pageantry start for you? Um, it started when I was about seventeen, and um, Mum had seen a little article in our local newspaper for Miss York, um, and I, it was nothing. I I had never thought about doing anything like that. And Mum was like, "Oh, just enter." And a few of my friends had said, "Oh, we think you'd be quite quite good at modelling and stuff." Um, I just didn't have the belief, so I entered. Um, because I was like, well, no one will know, it's fine. And then I went on and won it, so then oh, everybody wow. knew. <laughs> and I was like, oh, God. <laughs> what were your plans before then? What did you want to do? I wanted to be a makeup artist. Okay. Um, yeah, that, that was that was my plan. So I, I guess you, you traded that in and, yeah. and went for pageantry. Yeah, I wanted to be on the other side of the camera. Yeah. And I've ended up in front of it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's not too much of a bad exchange. No, no, I'm happy. The story of the Miss England 2007 pageant, which you won your crown in, um, is quite a rocky roller coaster. A lot happened in that one pageant, and that definitely shaped the person you are today, or at least your story. Um, it was internationally reported. Before, this is let's go a little bit before the um, hearing incident when everybody found out. Yeah. Um, it was internationally reported that um, the representatives of Miss England pageant committee asked you to fasten up a little bit. Um, and to get a more sort of womanly figure and help end anorexia among models. Yeah. So can you shed some light on the story? Then? That was quite hard for me because my figure is what it is. And I, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not stick thin by any, by any stretch. And I'm not kind of like a, you know, a plus size. I'm just, to me, normal. I don't not eat, you know, I, I, I have a healthy diet. Um, so it's quite hard for the media to have picked up on that because I didn't think there was anything particularly wrong with my figure so yeah when when you've got the media having that sort of attention on you that you've never had before it was difficult I guess you were quite I guess quite a sensitive subject yeah well. and plus I was only 18 at, at that point and so you know and by that point I hadn't finished my gr- growing and I wasn't you know I've definitely got a more womanly figure than I had now than I had back then yeah what do you think then of sort of the nature of these beauty pageants? And did that ever sort of put you off? No, I mean, it can't, It was more the media that did that than the beauty pageants. Okay. Um, they never told me to lose weight, put on weight, anything. And I won it. I won the competition how I was. It was only after I'd won the competition that that all kind of came, came about. 
and this owner, of, especially um, the recent appearance of Amy Riddleton and the celebrity. Yes. Um, and she that was sort of very mixed coverage of her. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, what did you think of the whole situation with her in the jungle? I, I think she she was hard done by in the jungle, to be honest. she's I've, I've met Amy a, a few times, and she is a really nice girl, really genuinely nice. Um, and, yeah, I think people are quick to judge beauty queens, and they were very quick to judge her. Um, and they were quite cruel with some of the comments. I thought Rebecca Adlington, you know, she that was fine. She was just self conscious. But um, was it Lu- was she called Lucy Page? Yeah. Yeah. I thought she was mean. I thought she was quite mean. So I mean, what do you think about people jumping to conclusions on sort of these um you know, pageant girls and yeah. the crowns? I mean, I guess that's not really fair then to. No, to it, it annoys me. It really, really annoys me. Um, and I've done numerous debates um, on radios with feminists oh, about the whole yeah. beauty pageant. And and actually, I think I won both of the debates that I did. Um, yeah, it just, it really gets my gut. I, I guess, yeah, if you're going to enter a beauty pageant, it's your choice. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, everybody does things that they're good at. And yeah. it just so happens we're good at, you know, modelling and promoting what we're passionate about and talking in front of front of lots of people and uh, yeah. and, and so on. Yeah. <laughs> you decided to keep your um, deaf ear quiet during the missing room trials. Yeah. Why was that? I mean, you said you told some of your friends. Yeah, I feel like a lot of people can use certain things that are maybe wrong in their lives to sway people's opinions. Okay. Um, and I wanted to win it purely on me being me and not on the fact that people might feel sorry for me or think, oh, that's a good sob story. We'll we'll pick her and yeah, make that. lots of money out of that story. Yeah. 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 And, I mean, do you think there's a negative stigma then attached to um, deaf people even if you're partially deaf? I don't think there is, no. I just think... People like to make money from people's stories. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, yeah, I don't. I don't think there's a there's a stigma attached. I would like to hope there isn't a stigma attached. You eventually announced that you had a um, a deaf ear when you didn't hear your number being called out as you were being called to the finals. Yeah. Sort of. What was it like that day that it all happened? Well, I felt so stupid because I'd I'd been my number got called and that was into the final. I think it was the final twelve or final ten or something. And when that happened, I was the first person to get called out and didn't hear my number. Someone had to nudge me. But we were all stood on stage in front of the judges when it happened. And I was stood there, I was like, oh, my God, they're gone. Because our numbers are on our wrists. Okay. You can't forget your number. Yeah. And I was like, God, they're going to think I'm so stupid. I'm just stood there clapping away and not, don't even know what number I am. And I thought I'd lost it. At that point, I was like, oh, my God, I've lost. I've totally lost this competition because I must have looked so stupid. Um, yeah, and it really annoyed me, but obviously then I went on to win it. The others didn't notice quite so much as I did. <laughs> well, I mean, how did you announce it then? How did you let people know? Um, I think after the competition, I spoke to my Miss England manager and just told her, you know, sometimes if I'm, you know, at a public event or whatnot, I might not hear people speaking to me and I don't think I'm rude. And she said, oh, well, why don't we, you know, why don't we go to the press and you know tell them your story and for me it was a lovely thing to do because it showed other people that you know no matter what you know what your disability might be you can do whatever you want to do with it and I mean so you won Miss England in 2007 then you went to the Miss World Talent pageant yeah. where you became one of the top 18 <laughs> semi-finest. So that's like, you've just, I mean, that's like one amazing sort of moment to another. Yeah. With this crazy roller coaster, you know, with the media and, um, you know, the, uh, you know, your hearing. I mean, what was that like to sort of, you know, two amazing things happening? Yeah, it was, do you know, it was the most unbelievable, um, unbelievable experience of my life. I've never... Never, never have, and never will do anything like that again. I imagine. Um, yeah, it was, it was brilliant. Do you have any plans then to enter any more pageants in the future? I think I might be a little bit past it now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 27 now, and I think I'm getting a bit old for the old pageantry. But um, no, carry, carrying on with my modelling career. Today you're wearing an Afolac Nano hearing aid. I am. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about it, how you benefit it, and sort of how it works with you? Yeah, I, I got contacted by um, the company that make them, 
um, they, you know, they wanted me to kind of front front the hearing aid, and I was absolutely over like um, over the moon when they asked me. Um, yeah, so I, I went ahead, went for the tests, and they found out they could give me this type of hearing aid that just kind of slotted into my ear, which is perfect for me and my modelling because you can't really see it unless I like to. It's like right in my ear unless I turn my head, um, and it was brilliant. And when they fitted it. I, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe how much I've been missing out. Like I, It was like I had a superpower all of a sudden. So it was a big sort of leap. Huge, yeah, huge. Uh, so moving on then to a very big part of your life now, yeah. which is your boyfriend, and your fiancé, in fact, <laughs> Danny uh, from McFly, um, which is obviously had, that's had also a lot of media attention. Mm-hmm. Um, he proposed to you whilst on holiday in, in Cyprus, I mean, was it love at first sight when you saw him? No, we actually hated each other. <laughs> Honestly, we did. We didn't, we're not hate, that's a strong word, but I just thought he was a typical pop star and he thought I was a typical model. Uh, he was dating, before he met you, he was dating Miss England 08. Yeah, no, that never happened. Oh, fine, yeah. that's it. Yeah, that was me- maybe a couple of dates, but never anything more than that. So that's it. We're going to go, in fact, on <laughs> He loves his Miss England. <laughs> we're that, we're going to go on to um, one of the headlines, actually, um, which I'm, I'm going to be fairly interesting. Definitely now you told us that wasn't true. Yeah. Um, I mean, being as successful as you were, um, and then you know, doing what you do, look, I'm looking like you do, and dealing with the tabloid critics, um, both in the pageant and then with Danny, and they they've kind of been, you know, there's been a lot of I love for you guys in the press. There's also has been definitely this story about Miss England 08, yeah. and it just wasn't true. And then you, I mean, the Daily Mail headline: Danny swapped 08 for a better model. <laughs> so, um, you know, and especially when you know that there's a deeper meaning and they've all got it wrong. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what was it and what is that like to have to do with It's that? strange when press do that because they can take, what they can do is take one thing that somebody says and as long as they've said that, they can, you know, word it in whatever way they want. So you might say one thing, but it comes across as you saying it in a different manner and yeah. it's hard because you do have to be careful and... I've definitely learned along the way that, you know, you, you've got to be careful sometimes what you say. Yeah, and especially with those false stories. Um, and again, another false story that um, you told me earlier that, you know, there was a whole story about Danny proposing to you five times, mm. which also never happened. No, we, we said that as a joke um, um, one night when yeah. we were out. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, and it just got turned into a story. So, I mean, even though the comments from that, um, and there were some, I mean, I don't have written here, but there's some very negative comments about you through that story. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, even with my journalistic sort of head on, uh, that's quite a sort of a, there were quite some harsh comments yeah. about you, especially when you sort of have never provoked that sort of thing. As you say, you were joking about it. I mean, you are just sort of sweet, nice, Georgia, and you're just sort of trying to get along, and this sort of happens. Um, and why do you think they've tried to be so personal about yours and Danny's relationship? I don't know. Do you mean the general public? Yeah, yeah. and also some of the comments. Yeah, I, like, I, I don't quite know what people are thinking when they sit and write those comments because I, I'm too busy to sit on a computer and write nasty comments about people I don't know. They must have really, really boring <laughs> lives. That's yeah. all I can think. I mean, I've, I tend to not read them so much anymore, but... I've read, I've read a few, and like some of them are just awful. Some of like really, really mean. I dread, I dread to think what it must be like for you know, like the likes of like Nicole Scherzinger or Cheryl Cole. They must get horrendous stuff. Yeah, I mean, does it? Obviously, it hurts you. Yeah. But sort of, do you have to just accept that that's now you're in the public eye? That's sort of part of your. Yeah, I just try to think to myself. Well, you know that. Like, I think a lot of the time it is just jealousy and they just want to be nasty. Um, And I've just got to remind myself of that and just think, well, you know, I'm happy. I've got a nice life. I'm happy with my life. I'm happy with my friends and my family and Danny. And that's all that matters. And these nasty comments, you've just got to forget about them. But it's true. It's true. One, you know, you can have... 100 lovely comments and one nasty one you'll always remember that one nasty one yeah and 
as this is the second McFly wedding then that's going to be happening after yeah. Tom's um, one last year. Uh, was two years ago, years ago now, I think. And that was to um, Giovanna, yes. uh, Giovanna Fletcher. Yes. Um, so have you, since being engaged to her, have you sort of been embraced into the McFly family? I've always been embraced into the <laughs> McFly family. They, um, they welcomed me with open arms. Do you think you and Giovanna being now, well, you to be the wife of a, of a McFly, and, and she already is, um, do you think you sort of got the sort of bond there? Yeah, think? absolutely. Because, you know, not many people have pop star boyfriends, fiancés, husbands, um, so we can totally relate to one another and, you know, the experiences that we go through and having, you know, our other halves away for long periods of time. Yeah, I know um, next year I'm going to see what busted. Ah, yeah. Yeah, what was your sort of reaction after you met Oh, it was brilliant. That's I can't wait. But I grew up with busted. So, yeah, yeah. So far, yeah. Like, they were, they were my band more than McFarland. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, interesting you say that then. Um, I sort of, I like to spice up interviews that are quite interesting. Yeah. So we're going to play a short little game. Okay. Um, I'm going to play some of my favourite McFarland fly songs yeah but just 10 seconds of them okay and you're just going to try to guess what songs they are right um, don't judge me on this <laughs> let's just try this one that's um uh i even know it love um love is easy love is easy yeah. <sighs> okay so that was number one I'm really bad at on the spot things <laughs> let's try this one pressure Oh no. This is an easy way to do. Do you love me? Do you? Do, do you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's close one. I basically just said the words that yeah. they said. <laughs> <laughs> um, this one, then. this is actually my favourite McFly song. Okay. Stargirl. Stargirl. I think it might be mine. I, I, I think so. It's, just, it's, so it's good, good, isn't it? It's and the cover one. they did for Chris Moore. Oh, it was brilliant, song. wasn't it? Yeah. Okay, yeah. here's the uh, fourth one to the penultimate. Okay. It's all. It's all about you. All about you. Yeah. Yep. I always get confused between that one and obviously. And this is then. This is one of their oldest ones. Oh. Um, five colours in her hair. Yeah, I love how you're doing a dance. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't do a dance. <laughs> that just came involuntarily. <laughs> okay. Yep. Yeah, so that's five out of five. And you're yeah. You're gonna get anything. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Oh, I'm so pleased. Did you like um, McFly's songs before you? Yeah, Danny? yeah, I did. So, I, did. I, I mean, where did you guys meet them? Uh, we met um, in a in a club, very boring. Mm. <laughs> so, um, at Tom's wedding, he performed a medley of McFly songs. He did. And in the video, we can actually see you in a red dress. Yeah. I know loads of people are going to be wondering what it's actually like to be at that amazing wedding. Oh, it was fabulous um bar my sister's wedding it was the best wedding i've ever been to it was just phenomenal i think one of the things i think is great about mcfly is that they're one of those huge bands they also managed to they they haven't sold out at all there are definitely some boy bands there that's very obvious what you're hearing isn't their creation i know they write a lot of their own songs as well they write songs for other bands uh -huh. but also they seem so they seem so Genuine. Yeah, they are. They're best friends. So I, yeah. I, I know definitely if you look at One Direction, and this is only for me watching their performances, Yeah. there always seems to be like a uh, forced nature. Do you think so? Them. Yeah. I think definitely their children, recent children who need one. It yeah. may just be because they're tired and just come out of a world tour. Who knows? But it, yeah. There always seems to be in boy bands at tension. And yeah, I, I do think you can tell when, when a band genuinely... Like love loves each other to bits and the boys do like you know the the do and and it does show i think it shows in the performance is absolutely and i mean their 10th anniversary performance at the royal albert hall oh. was sort of a confirmation of that yeah ten, i mean 10 years together it's got i know, a boy band I know. it's a good going isn't it yeah I, I don't know what other boy bands have been together that long i know currently there's predictions that one Direction will only stay together for another three years. Really? And, then, and so even so, they would have only been around for like six years by that time. So that's so, right. So not long then. Um, so yeah. So well, they, like, they've, they've made their, their big books, haven't they? Now yeah. so they're set up for life, I think. Before entering the Miss England pageant, 
Um, you also hope to get a degree, I said, in design and media makeup. And yeah. You go into there. Do you have any plans to, in the future, maybe go into any of these areas? I don't think so. I think kind of my, my career has gone off on a different tangent now, so I probably won't come back round to that. I'm not closing the door on it. I may well do. I still love doing doing anything to do with you know makeup, but um, no, I don't think it will go back. Do you have any looking at the pageantry? Do you have any sort of and also I mean the um you, you know losing your hearing and the timing which you told people? Do you have any regrets of anything that's sort of happened in the past? Um, any regrets? I don't think I do. No. I try, I try not to have any. I think I've probably made some mistakes, but not that I regret because I think every mistake you make makes you who you are. And it, it really does, you know, like past relationships and, and whatever. It, it might be hor- horrendous at the time, but afterwards I think you learn from it. You live and you learn, don't you? How do you also help and support people who are going through what you went through when you were younger? Um, with sort of hearing loss? I just want to show show people that go, are going through the same thing as me that, you know, you can achieve anything you set out to achieve. And the technology now is so advanced. You know, when I was younger, it wasn't what it is now and it wasn't the coolest thing. But now it's it's so easy to, to get your hearing back and without without it being quite obvious... Um, so yeah, I think I think that's something I want young the younger generation to understand and to not feel embarrassed by it and to make sure they do help tell people because that was one of my mistakes when I was younger and you know you don't want people thinking you're rude and don't speak. <laughs> so in reflection, then would you have gotten a hearing aid aid at a younger age, despite the fact that it was sort of very big and? I probably wouldn't have got a really big one, just because. I just wouldn't want to. It's not you don't like things like that when you're a young kid. But if it was like this, if you know, current day, like what it is now, absolutely. Yeah, I wouldn't have had any hesitation of getting this here in Ed. Brilliant. Well yeah. thank you so much for no, speaking to me. You're welcome. Today. Thank you very yeah, much thank for you. having me.